Okay, so, thank you very much for coming, everybody. For those of you who haven't been to one of these before, this is part of a season we call Change History, which the campaign team organised to look at movements from the past from which we can learn, because we all stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of changing the world. And no bigger giant than the movement for LGBT equality, which has probably achieved faster social change than any issue in our lifetimes. And in the UK, Stonewall has been absolutely at the heart of that. So our speaker today is Ruth Hunt, who is the Chief Executive of Stonewall. She was there when the organisation achieved its founding mission. Now, if you think about that, there are hardly any organisations in Britain, charities who were set up with one aim, who can say unequivocally that they have achieved it. So for Stonewall, that was complete legal equality for LGBT people, which was achieved. But Stonewall has never rested on the world. And since then, the Centre for the Executive has moved on for campaigning for policy and legal equality to look at trans issues, to look at how it relates to the BME community, to look crucially at how it interacts with faith communities. And Ruth has been at the forefront of all that change. Now, Stonewall is a charity. So if you appreciate what you hear today, please give some money. Please become a Stonewall supporter. It accepts allies and friends from all backgrounds and all stripes, so please get involved in what it does. If you are interested in what you're hearing today, please uh, follow along with hashtag, which is hashtag change history, and we will put up a YouTube of this talk later for colleagues who weren't able to be here today and for you to learn from in the future. I'll hand over to Ruth. Thank you very much, Kirsty, oh, thank you very much, Kirsty, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about British LGBT equality, mainly because we've got 20 minutes. Um, the world is a big place. There's huge amounts that have gone on and continue to go on. I will talk a little bit about the international context at the end. Um, I will also talk a little bit about my reflections on the LGBT movement, why I think certain things have happened when they've happened. Those are subjective. I think other people would have a different interpretation of some of those events and I will try and signal when I'm basically putting my slant on it and when I think Wikipedia would say something different. So, um, I, um, Ruth, I was uh, started at Stonewall 10 years ago as a policy officer, and Stonewall at that stage was 25 staff with a 1.8 million turnover. So Stonewall is now 100 staff and a 6.6 .6 million turnover, which is an unusual trajectory for a social movement that is supposed to be done now. And I'm going to talk more about that as well. So let's just go right back for a moment on where we were at with LGBT history, if you like. There has always been gay people, um, and I will use the word gay deliberately at times. When I talk about LGBT, I'm talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people. But often our movement hasn't been an LGBT movement, it's been a gay movement. And I'll be quite deliberate about my language of that, it's not shorthand. So, LGBT people have existed forever and ever. Um, Vic Queen Victoria got a bit twitched about it in the late 18th century, mainly a concern about the prevalence of syphilis and lots of other terrible sexually transmitted diseases that seem to be happening between men, and therefore Queen Victoria concluded that it was best to stop gay men having sex at all. She didn't mention lesbians. The kind of myth is that because she didn't know what lesbians do, that's nonsense. She didn't mention lesbians because she didn't want to give women any ideas. Um, and basically, you tell, tell women things, they get ideas, we find. Um, so there was a kind of always an anxiety about, about what men were doing. And that obsession about male sexuality was also seen going as far back as the dissolution of the monasteries. Now, just indulge me for a moment, because I do a lot of work with the Church of England and the Catholic Church. What was interesting about King Henry's work is that he wanted to dissolve the monasteries, he wanted to get divorced, he therefore needed to create the Church of England. Part of the way he could justify going into the monasteries was basically suggesting the monks were all at it all the time. So there's a whole narrative going along in, um, in King Henry VIII's time about how the monasteries were a den of homosexual activity. I think it probably was, like most monasteries now, but you know, it's fine. So sexual orientation has always been used as something to control freedoms. It's always symbolized a clamping down on any kind of freedom. And where you see oppression around sexual orientation, you generally see oppression around gender as well. The, the, the two go together. Anyway, so time passes. 
the uh, acts between two men were criminalised, and that, that lasted for a very long time. And I share that with you, and this is the only time I'll look at my notes because I can never remember dates. The homosexual acts were actually decriminalised in 1967, so only 50 years ago, really. And it, the age of consent between two men was 21. In Northern Ireland, it was decriminalised in 1981. So this is all in the blink of an eye. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, this is not a, a, a long history of liberation. When Stonewall got involved, there were a number of different organisations, homosexual rights organisations were the words that were used, building up to the kind of increased legal equality for gay men. Um, trans were in a different category, bisexual didn't exist at all, and lesbians made the tea. And, and that's not a joke, every gay liberation front, all the gay liberation movements were led by men and the women would make the tea. So although there was quite an amazing feminist lesbian movement going on, within the wider LGBT movement, women were pretty much um, relegated to a different role in that. Very white in terms of a political movement and very elitist. I would say. That's my interpretation of, of some of that history. So anyway, around, we've got, around 1980s, we had HIV. And so on top of this kind of ongoing historical persecution, we then were able to blame all gay men for this new disease called AIDS. And then we had a government which introduced Section 28. Now, you're all too young, but I'll kind of tell you about Section 28. Section 28 was prompted by, I think, HIV. I think it was but prompted by that anxiety about young people turning gay and getting, getting diseases. But it was also prompted by a book of very dubious quality called Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin. Now, Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin is the single most disappointing children's book you'll ever encounter. <laughs> it tells the story of Jenny, who lives with Martin, her dad. And Martin left his mum, her mum, and moved in with Eric. So Eric and Martin were a couple, Jenny lived with Eric and Martin. Got it? Page after page of mundane activity. Um, and on about page 12, 13, Jenny is seen to get into bed in the morning with Eric and Martin to have breakfast. And in Wales, we call that a morning kutch. It's, it's what you do in the morning have a bit of a snuggle down and have a chat about your day. The government at the time felt that this was such an unequivocal risk to children throughout Britain, they decided to ban that book. Now, all of you who know anything about uh, social movements, banning books always triggers a good start to any social change. So they banned books. So every local authority, every school, every public funded body was told they were not under any circumstances allowed to promote homosexuality. So that was in 1987, and it marked a very profound moment in the LGBT movement. 25 years prior to that, we'd had the Stonewall riots in America, and that's a kind of different narrative, but what we had in the late 1980s was a generation of young gay people who the generation before had been told they were responsible for HIV and AIDS. The generation before that had been told they were completely unlawful and illegal. And this was now the fourth generation who were basically told that families would pretend. So against a backdrop where there was increasing legislation around gender, and I know you've heard about the kind of gender equality, there was an increasing recognition of equalities, um, equal ops, political correctness, I mean there was all that kind of narrative, but like women working here soon, this was a very negative, systematic back step away from LGBT people. And what that prompted was a number of different social movements. What was happening for trans at the time is people who were trans, people who fully transitioned from one gender to another, were able to do that with relatively little intervention. So nobody really cared. You could change all your records, you could do what you want, nobody cared. There was a case where a woman divorced her husband, was unhappy with the settlement, and it went to a higher court, and the court ruled that she shouldn't have been able to marry her husband in the first place because she was legally a man. And so overnight, the great force of government came down, deciding who could change gender or who could not. So there were two very profound moments in the late 80s that significantly impacted on LGBT equality. So a Conservative MP, here's a, here's a myth, but I think it's probably true. A Conservative MP approached Ian McKellen, aka Gandalf, depending on your generation, <laughs> and Jen Tool, um, hooked up with Michael Cashman and a couple of others, and said, decided that there needed to be an entirely new lobbying organisation set up. 
And the lobbying organisation needed to be non-democratic, <coughs> utterly pragmatic, needed to match the client, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and needed to work on the basis of gaining consensus with every group they worked with. They needed to present a presentable face of game. It's what began, I think, the dawning of the good game. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The stone was set up, not much money, they did fundraisers and they did big concerts and <coughs> things like that, mainly to lobby Parliament. And Ian McKellen went to meet John Major and he said, these are the ten things I want. And John Major said, I will deliver you every one of those pieces of legislation. And that's something that sometimes gets lost in the narrative as well. So Major was very up for it. Unfortunately, nobody was very up for Major. Um, and so we came in in 97 with, with of course, the Labour government in three terms. And those three terms of Labour government meant that each one of those legal changes could be and would be achieved. It's very easy to look back and think that was a doddle. It was by no means a doddle, because there were lots of different levels of opposition that were never based, they swore down, on homophobia, but on a general discomfort. So age of consent, gay people in the military, um, the right to adopt, the Human Fertilisation Embryology Act that gave lesbians the right to be parents, the Gender Recognition Act, Civil Partnership Act, Marriage Act, these are all very complex bits of legislation that were all subject to a free vote. They were never subject to a whip. It was always about persuading people. And what Stonewall learned very quickly is that it had to be cross-bench. There's no way we could make it a Labour Party thing. And we had to go for the middle ground. And what Stonewall learned was to often occupy that very middle ground. What that required was a very presentable face of game. And I think what Stonewall did during that kind of 95 to 2005, 6, 7 was adopt quite an assimilationist approach to LGBT equality. So one of the reasons why I think LGBT rights have moved on at a much more rapid pace is because we were ever so, ever so normal. And we were male. And I think men persuade men. And I think, and this is my personal view, YouTube, that it was easier to move gay men who were increasingly out in Parliament, increasingly out in the Lords. Gay men were good at persuading gay men. And what we were able to do is talk to them about them. And our greatest strength was the synergy we were achieving between our beneficiaries, our donors, the people we were trying to support, and the people we were trying to convince. And then we were talking to people's mums who had gay sons. But it was a very, it was a very assimilationist way of doing things. It was a very clean and balanced presentation of what it was to be gay. Certainly not promiscuous, certainly not non-monogamous. We just want to get married, have a couple of kids, have a good job, nice, clean, tax-paying, normal, normal, normal people. There's nothing queer or odd about being LGBT. And I think that, is what saw the progress that we've seen in Great Britain, and it's what's triggered the progress in America. And so, as Kirsty says, job done. We've got full legal equality, push, push, push. And if I was, and I at that time was climbing Stonewall's ranks, so I was employed to develop a policy research function. And we conducted primary research into all sorts of different areas, health, education, hate crime, public attitude polling, what is the state of the nation, basically? What is happening to LGBT people in this country? How are they experiencing discrimination? <coughs> and in the first year when Section 28 was repealed, we started Education for All, and we talked about 15 and 16 year old lesbian and gay pupils in schools. We didn't talk about bisexuals, and we didn't talk about trans. We kept it nice and simple. Because, and I'll, I'll challenge myself on this in a moment, just stay with me for now, what we realised is we had to work with wherever an organisation was at. We introduced the Workplace Programme, we now work with 750 employers. When we started that 10 years ago, we had 20 employers and four of them were anonymous. They didn't want to be known to be doing this work. And so it's quite clear, through all our different policy interventions, we work with people at five different stages. Stage one, do you have any gay staff or gay people? No. Those are the groups that I tend to work with now. Um, faith groups, um, major faith schools or uh, smaller organisations. No, we haven't got any gay staff, we don't need to thank you very much. Second stage of organisation, do you have any gay staff? Yes. 
he's here, he's very happy. Um, <laughs> he, he says it's a great place to be gay, and he's such a laugh, and it's fantastic. And we go shopping together. Um, third stage, you have any gay staff? Yes, we've got an LGBT network, and three gay men go to the pub every Friday and talk about how hard it is to be gay. <laughs> Fourth stage, you have any LGBT staff? Yes, we've now got a lesbian. And she's done the Workplace Quality Index for us, and she's filling in all the paperwork, and it's great, and we're making some really good progress. Fifth stage of organisation is, yes, and we acknowledge we've got bisexual staff, we've acknowledged we've got trans staff, and what we've realised is that if people are able to be themselves at home, at work, at church, at school, in their neighbourhoods, they are more likely to be happy, deliver, perform better, and be themselves. So some of the most sophisticated work we do now is about actually enabling people to be themselves. What that's meant is that Stonewall has had to move away from that assimilationist way of thinking. And to a certain extent that might be personality driven, and I don't know, charities are often led by the personality of who's leading them, that's kind of inevitable. But I know I would have been less effective as a chief executive during that time of intense political lobbying. Now that might be typical hashtag female self-doubt, but I would not have landed as well in those situations. I certainly wouldn't look as I look now. And I was under a lot of um, encouragement from a range of female mentors to don the blouses and get the cleavage and start wearing makeup and accessories and brooches. And it's just not me. Like, I look really stupid. But every time one of my so-called mentors tells me to buy an accessory, I just buy them a tie now. I couldn't, I couldn't have done that as a deputy or a director or as one of those other staff working in Parliament. I would have been too odd, too other, too different. And so we, I think, as a movement, made quite a lot of sacrifices in order to secure what we've secured now. And I think it will be a debate for history to decide whether that was the right strategic approach. And on the one hand, would we have got everything we'd have got? Would we get everything we get if we didn't put ourselves alongside? And Stone has always been of the belief that we sit alongside. Now, I have a uh, Catholic background. I, I'm Catholic, but that's very personal to me. Um, as soon as I got appointed, it was the headline in The Independent, which meant I had to be a really good Catholic really quickly. Um, I know use contraception, so I'm actually a better Catholic than most. <laughs> but I've had to learn and, and heighten that part of me in order to sit alongside faith groups. And I now sit alongside faith communities and help them work out what they're going to do. Because Stonewall can never be the organisation standing outside shouting at the wall. We will always sit alongside. So I think history will decide whether that was the right approach. I think that this has always been a nudge organisation and a nudge campaign. I think that it is something that remains important to keep nudging. But I think we now have a responsibility to stretch the capabilities of the partners we work with. So I do now go to meetings dressed like this. I do go in to meetings with ministers dressed like this. And I say, it's not just about the nice, white, middle class, educated, high income earning, gay man who's dissolved his first civil partnership with a good amicable settlement and is now on his second. It's actually about the kid from a low income background who is unlikely to go to university, is unlikely to leave home until he's married, and the thought of telling his imam that he's gay is never going to happen. The challenge for Stonewall is how do we take all those people who've supported us almost like a trade union in order for us to gain equality for them to now think that they should be supporting us to gain equality for others. So that symbiosis and that presentable face and that look how grown up we are and mature and sensible and good gay, which has got us so far, how do we now shift the social movement? And the challenge facing Stonewall is how do we get basically the gay movement to stop being selfish? And how do we get the gay movement to think about bisexual people and lesbians and trans people? And how do we get lesbians to think about trans people? And how do we get all those LGBT people to think about people from low income backgrounds? How do we get all of those people to think about people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds? How do we get the rich, powerful, BAME, LGBT people to think about how they can support those from lower income backgrounds? How can we stop the movement 
being quite so what about me, and instead, what about us? Which turns us to one of the final challenges, and perhaps of most relevance to you, is the international work. So all of those who've supported us over the last 20 years, get me marriage, get me this, get me this, get me this, okay, you've got me this, what are you doing about ISIS? Um, which is always a joy, because ha ha if I could work out what to do about ISIS, I would be in a different job, I think. Um, and the answer to what are you doing about ISIS is, well, MI5 came top of our employers last week, and if they can't work out those connections, then I'm not going to make them for them and breach my official secret site. The point is, that the way in which we work internationally cannot be the way we work domestically. And everybody who has been part of this movement from 1967 to now, every single one of them thinks they are a gay rights campaigner and expert. Which, as a chief executive of charity doing this work, is a joy. <laughs> Absolute joy. Um, particularly because, I mean, I've never um, always, always enjoy being patronised as well. That's always good. As, as well. um, so, how do you convince all these people who've been giving us £20 a month, £30 a month, £40 a month to say, we're now going to do something different internationally and you don't know the answer? And the person who knows the answer is the group of LGBT activists in Uganda. And the group of activists, LGBT activists in Uganda have asked us to shut up. And please could we spend them stethoscopes because it means that their HIV positive members can go to clinic looking like doctors and not get homophobic abuse. The most useful thing that Stonewall can do right now is send us some stethoscopes. And we have to say, okay, is that the most useful thing? Let's talk to someone who's an expert in Uganda. Let's do this, let's do this. But let's shut up. So the greatest challenge for Stonewall is twofold. The first, how do we convince our British supporters about how we work internationally? And we're doing different work. So we're training activists in other countries. We are very quietly and very discreetly bringing them over here and we're going over there. We are sharing our knowledge from the last 25 years, translating all our materials. Some people get it over it in Russian, goes down a storm. All that kind of stuff we can do very easily. Second, getting our big employers to start taking responsibility for the soft economics they can demonstrate in those countries. And third work around the kind of UNICEF and DFID and FCO and the nudging and organisations like yourselves nudging you to start thinking more consciously about LGBT people. Organisations like yourselves doing all you can to support your LGBT people in the field to use their influence in a way that's safe. Organisations like yourself working out if your LGBT staff truly feel able to be themselves in your London office, looking at how you're doing these things. But the third challenge is how do we bring that British audience with us so they don't go charging in? And that is a real challenge. The second challenge to that is we've got to strip the ego out. So Stonewall is legendary good at saying well to ourselves. We, we are really good at going, God, we've done well. Have we done well? Gosh, we've done terribly well. Internationally, we've got to shut up. And any international victory has nothing to do with us whatsoever, even if we've done any tinkering. And that is a cultural shock to an LGBT movement. And what we're seeing in America, now they've got marriage, and what's interesting about America, now they've got marriage, you can still go from one state to another and be fired for being gay. You can lose parental rights of your child from one state to another. You can lose your access to your medical care if you're HIV positive. There's plenty for America to be done. Marriage has become the golden globe. Their funders, the fund organisations like us, said, oh my god, what are you going to do about ISIS? Um, giving them lots of money, those organisations have said, yeah, we're going to do international. Where should we start? Let's start with Europe. Where are we going to start in Europe? Well, let's start in Britain. So we're really welcoming the number of LGBT American organisations who are coming to help us right now. Um, but part of our challenge with them is teaching them how to listen, how to respect, how to respond to the needs of the activists on the ground, and how to strip out the ego. So these are very different challenges facing the LGBT rights movement now. Just finally, I want to say, so we're pursuing all these work, we're pursuing the policies, we're going deeper into our community, <coughs> we're helping, we're sitting alongside, maintaining that nudge philosophy, but celebrating, our tagline is now acceptance without exception, celebrating the full diversity of the LGBT communities, embracing all the complexity that comes with that, but also maintaining that knowledge philosophy. But the greatest challenge is by maintaining that momentum. Hate crime is as high as it ever was, and we have to be cautious about slipping back. 
and there are major changes to the public sector, there are major changes happening across this country, right under our noses, the ease with which homophobia can flourish in those kind of spaces must not be underestimated. So it's a more difficult task with more difficult stakeholders, more difficult ways of communicating, more difficult approaches, but no complacency, but it doesn't lend itself to Twitter in the same way. So my top tip to campaigners is make sure you gain as much consensus as possible from a wider base as possible. We all talk to ourselves all the time. The more people you can bring into that middle zone, the better. Watch where you compromise is our lesson. Be careful where you compromise on that. Second top tip, nobody cares as much as you do. Nobody will ever care as much as you do. So however much you think what you're campaigning about is the single most important thing in the world, nobody will care as much as you do. And when you go home, you stop caring, let's be honest. Or after a long week, you might go, do you know what, I'm so over it. You've got to realise that nobody will be as excited as you. Third top tip, never underestimate how stupid the people you are who you're talking to. And this is something that we always have to remember. If they don't care, they're not interested, they didn't, weren't inclined to follow, they're not going to follow a complex narrative. And a lot of what we're involved in now is complex. It requires layer upon layer upon layer of explanation, and it is easily swept away with one headline that reduces everything you're doing. Don't underestimate people's laziness in responding to that headline. So as campaigners, you've got to be ahead of that and making the headline yourself. And of course, Kirsty, who I've known for quite some time, has taught me everything I know, honest. Um, knows how to do this very well, but it is a discipline. Because the tireder you get, and the more, the more frustrated you get, the easier it is to slip into that longer way of talking about stuff. So keep it crisp, bring people with you, and um, be careful how you compromise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Ruth has kindly agreed to answer uh, a few questions, so if you're on link, uh, please write your questions and I can ask them for you. And if you're in the room, I will run the microphone backwards and forwards so that people can also hear. Um, so I think Alice, can you start us off? Thanks. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, I had a question about your top tip about bringing people into the middle ground. It's reminded me of the early kind of 2000s when you saw outside G7 summits and WTO meetings, this unlikely coalition of like trade unions who came from industry working, walking and protesting alongside environmentalists who would traditionally not sort of share the same ethos. Um, in terms of your movement, what have been the most unusual coalitions that you can share? And also, perhaps this is linked, um, how do you work with the military? And has that been a hard nut to crack? So, so we love um, counterintuitive coalitions, and it, it's the only thing that drives it forward, and we're always seeking counterintuitive coalitions. One of the most interesting ones that was the highest risk for us, one of the highest risks for us, was our partnership with Pally Power. So we've got a campaign called the Rainbow Laces Campaign, um, and we get Premier League footballers put Rainbow Laces in their boots, the primary schools put them in their boots, the, you know, the kids put them in their boots, but the, the money behind it was Paddy Power. Now, Paddy Power, you're probably all much too lovely to know about Paddy Power. Paddy Power's, Power's a betting agency and they get away with making, they get lots of additional coverage above and beyond what they spend on their advertising because they're a bit naughty. And I think that's the most diplomatic on record where I can put it. So Stonewall, we were like, are we one tweet away from a PR disaster here? You know, and so the, um, the, the, the message was we're right behind gay footballers, um, <laughs> um, you know, lace up, there's a picture of a guy bending down. It's it all just a little bit revolutionary, but it spoke to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of heterosexual white men watching football. And the challenge for us is how do we, how far will we go, how will we get the balance, why is it too risky? So, so there's partnerships that are a bit risky. In terms of people joining on a, on a parliamentary campaign, um, Adoption was one of the weird ones where we got quite a lot of broad support. So Stonewall, on Section 28 and Adoption, worked very hard to bring in Bernardo's, NSPCC, those kind of organisations, and made it all about the safety of the child, made it all about the child. 
um, and worked very closely with them. But actually then we're bringing quite a lot of different liberal faith organisations who are concerned about adoption than the local authorities. So it's quite a nice coalition of different working. Final example I give you is we've just launched a campaign called the LGBTI Mission, um, www.lgbtimission.org.uk. And that has no Stonewall fingerprints on it. There is no Stonewall logo, there is no Stonewall hashtags, uh, it doesn't look Stonewall, it looks very primitive and basic, the website is basic. That is Stonewall working in partnership with 12 different characters from the Church of England, teaching them how to be campaigners, teaching them, we've given them media training, teaching them how to make really complex things as simple as possible so anyone can pick it up and read it. So we've got a bishop, a vicar, um, you know, there's this group of really easy to work with people, um, all working together on this campaign to Church of England. And that's a very different way of us working. Kind of how, do you, how do you remove your own need to brand everything and own everything to actually let people run with stuff? And that's a challenge for Stonewall because we quite like to hold on to stuff. And part of our future vision, so our new business priorities are transforming institutions, empowering individuals, changing hearts and minds and changing the law. The empowering individuals, um, which we do through uh, role model programs with employers, we do through activist campaigning, uh, campaign camps for kids, whatever we call it. You call it whatever the client wants to be calling it. Personal and professional development for local authorities, whatever. We've created a stone army. And what it is, is all these people who spend a day with us, learning how to get over their anxiety about their identity, standing forward and deciding they're going to change something. And they are changing how their school governors work, or they're changing how their guide group works, whatever they can do to change but we have no control over what they're changing. We can make suggestions, but if they want to do a rainbow panda campaign, like whatever, we can't really stop that. And that's been quite an, an uh, emotional challenge for Stonewall to let go of some of that stuff. So let it go. Thank you. Anyone? Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks, Ruth. Um, so we've all got theories of change, and clearly what I think we'd all agree is that there's lots and lots of different elements that come together to lead to change, and this sort of insider-outsider strategy, because clearly what Stonewall has been able to do by sitting alongside people has been to also build on movements that went on for, for decades before, of course, through trade unions, through local authorities in particular, and Section 28 was primarily trying to stop some local authorities that were trying to do something about inequality, about inequality um, to actually ban by law from doing it. And that sort of built up through the, uh, obviously people coming out, through the women's, women's movement, kind of set up this, this kind of consensus among some elements of, in the political class that equality was a good thing. And uh, then we're, what Stonewall was fantastically able to do was work with those, find a way through, and then build a consensus that started to slowly bring um, the Conservatives eventually into that as well. Um, I think it's fantastic that Stonewall is turning its attention to international because I think it is the most important uh, area we should all be, be thinking about in terms of equality of what's actually going on in lots of people in lots and lots of countries. We had Frank Nagisha from, from Uganda come and give a talk here um, a couple of months ago. Um, but I wonder whether that sort of background of a kind of embedding into different social movements is happening in some of the African countries where we want to see a change. And I'm not seeing that there is a strong sense of that, but it's, it's kind of trying to sort of do the, the persuasion at political level without necessarily a very long history. And I kind of wonder what lessons we can take from the UK to apply to a country like the Canada. Thank you, great question. And I, and I absolutely agree with your interpretation. Stonewall came as a result of everything that had gone on around. It, it, and I think that any, any good look at, at all that history will show. But I think that what's important to remember is that it was a very, very hard to be an activist in the 60s and 70s. And that trauma stays for generations, I think. I think that the, the experience of LGBT young people now is shaped by those decades of oppression that have experienced have been experienced across the years. No, so Stonewall was the was the nice, easy, clean version as a result of all that hard work. What we're seeing internationally, and I think I would just say that at the moment Stonewall's outputs on international is about ten percent. Because we are aware that there is still lots to do in the UK. High levels of hate crime for every school that's doing well, there's another school that's really struggling. Uh, we're not even talking about preschools yet. Um, there's lots to do there in terms of making sure 
kids, particularly those with different families. And there are hundreds and hundreds of sectors. I didn't talk about the military, I'm coming back to that. Hundreds and hundreds of sectors who have yet to kind of even work, including international NGOs, actually. You know, so international NGOs have significant money. Um, for example, might be doing work around ending violence against women, but would never consider lesbians as part of that. You know, and so Stonewall's got quite a lot of work to do to make sure that LGBT is incorporated and integrated into some of that thinking. Um, I think there is a difference between, so we, we support movements that exist on the ground. Um, and I think that there is a difference between some LGBT movements that are starting without that context and others that are very firmly rooted in human rights movements and women's <coughs> movements. Um, and, and I got into a lot of trouble about Brunei, so I won't go too much into that, but what's interesting about Brunei is that it is the women's and human rights movements that are that are running that, because an LGBT movement can't exist, nor should it, and it won't be as effective if it wasn't part of that movement. So we are strongly advising that the more you gain consensus, the better. So we did some really interesting work in Armenia, and the work we did in Armenia, which I can talk more frankly about, we brought together the trade unions, the women's groups, and we talked very carefully about allies. And in somewhere like India, we talk about allies, because actually getting people to say, I'm LGBT and I want to campaign, is quite tricky, and there are existing social movements that should be expanded. New European countries persuading their trade union movements to embrace LGBT is really difficult. That's, that's really difficult. So something we're talking to the TUC about is how they can have relationships with their sister organisations, telling them that this should be included. So, so there's a lot more of those different levers going on at this stage. In terms of the military, the military were a tough nut to crack when we were all at school, and what happened is we were a little. When Stonewall took the armed forces to the European Court of Rights, the European Court to allow LGBT people to serve in the armed forces, so it had to go to Europe. What's interesting internationally is that letting gay people serve in the armed forces is one of the first things that change on, on international levels. Because letting gay people die for us is kind of all right. Letting people love each other is pretty dodgy, but they can certainly not die for us. So that's actually one of the first legal changes that are coming. Now the armed forces are probably, and I, and I also include secret service in this, are one of the best groups we work with. Far better than um, international NGOs, uh, far better than um, a lot of the <coughs> public bodies, because they recognise very quickly that if you are living in a tank for three days with four other men, and one of them's keeping a secret and is really messed up, the risk to the mission is really immense. So all your recruits, all your forces, all your staff need to be able to be themselves wherever they are in whatever context. So they learn that very quickly. So we've been doing it for about a decade. So now the Royal Navy is some of the most extraordinary environments. And what's happening is young LGBT people are joining the armed forces because they think they're more likely to be able to be themselves than if they joined their local authority as an employee or their local bank or any of those things. So it's really interesting how, they've, how quickly they grasp the relevance of authenticity to performance and how quickly that's changing. That means that the army and the armed forces are doing a lot of international influencing. And actually there's a lot of soft diplomacy in our British army going to talk to the army in America and the army in South Americas about making sure that their gay staff feel able to be themselves. So it's a really interesting lever that we've used. Um, but again, it's about sitting alongside. So sometimes I get criticised, and I do a lot with them. I've been on tanks and learn how to climb submarines and stuff, um, which is which is humbling for all of us. But um, and so how can you work with them, Ruth? And the reality is, Stone is not a anti-disestablishment anarchist organisation. You know, we are very mainstream. We are very nudging, but we will always need some of those on the outside and some of those on the other side, pushing us in different ways. So I'm very proud of the work we do with the armed forces because I think they set a really good example to everyone else who tells me they don't need to do the work or that it's too easy and they've done it. And they've got a game member staff and it's all fine. <coughs> Thanks, Ruth. Um, my name's John and I'd like to pick your brain about campaigning. Um, so my background is I'm the uh, head of brand here, I'm quite new, so hi guys. And outside of Save the Children, I'm uh, chair of uh, an organisation called Positive the UK, which provides peer support for people that have got um, 
HIV and uh, we get offer them counselling either one to one or in groups. And one of the issues, we have a small campaigning uh, uh, capability and uh, what we're seeing is, or what I'm seeing is HIV hurtle off the agenda of, of the national consciousness. The narrative is just being lost. So what was a big issue in the 1980s has gradually and gradually and gradually decayed. National stays on the 1st of December and it passed by with virtually unnoticed this year. So I'm, I'm starting to think about what can we do? And, and sorry, as a result, the stigma and prejudice that people suffer with HIV continues uh, unabated and there's a void now of messaging. And so in that void, people make up whatever they want to make up. So any thoughts on kickstarting or re-energizing, re campaigning on something that's kind of been huge, gone, how do we re-engage and reconnect and reassert uh, a narrative for the future? Yep. Um, so, it's been an interesting time in, in, in the HIV world, I think, and, you, and you'll know more than me, but there has been something of a hiatus in some of the national voices, she said diplomatically. Um, and I think that has an impact, and it shows the power of what happens when one of the big organisations drops out, um, particularly when those big organisations has all the money to do the comms. So it, it, a lot of these things are led by money and led by power and led by the ability to lead rigid meeting issues. One of the concerns that we have about HIV in Stonewall is that one day they will find a cure for HIV, but that there will be an equally potent disease that will affect the gay community. And actually there are much more important, bigger issues to be talked about in terms of gay men um, and men who have sex with men. And, and why they continue to get HIV, why the levels are as high as they ever were, and what's going on. And I think that that requires the community to ask some challenging questions about some of those existing, or not, not positive in the UK, but some of those existing organisations that were responsible for the comms as to exactly what's gone wrong over the last decade. Because I don't think we can call it a success story. And I think part of campaigning is we should be honest about that. We should say, hold on a minute, we poured all this money into HIV prevention, has HIV been prevented? No. So what's going wrong and what do we need to do differently? And how much are um, local groups shaping some of that narrative? And I remember my girlfriend's first job was in Positively Women. And the amazing work that used to go on on that very close to the ground organisations that were very much in touch with people who were experiencing and living with HIV has got lost a bit in some of the narrative. So I think there's something about reminding people that it's still an issue. So one of the challenges we face in Stonewall is a lot of Stonewall's old supporters say, yeah, but it's okay now. What have, what have you got to do? And it's a real challenge for us because it doesn't lend itself to, yeah, but you can't get married. It's, yes, but if you were fired and poor, then it would be harder. And I explained once to one guy, I said, well, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in a classroom and you're the geek in the classroom, you're not the head boy, you're not going to Oxford, being gay in that situation is much more difficult. You're more likely to get bullied if you're the kid at the back of the class who's struggling and being gay than the kid at the front of the class who's doing well and being gay. And he said, well, that kid was always going to get bullied. And I was like, what's it? Okay, let's give up then. <laughs> so what does that mean? Does that mean that we only ever look after those who, who would be fine if it wasn't for oppression? Or do we acknowledge that all those who are experiencing oppression should be under his arm? And I think there's something about HIV that because people are living for longer, they presume that, that, that there's a subset who are now okay. It's not worrying people in the same level of the consciousness. It worries me a lot. I think you'll find the lesbians are still worried about it. So we've got to find a way of amplifying that again. And I think that means much more cooperation between HIV organisations. Any more? Thank you. Yes, you have a question from Link. Um, to give, uh, to give context to this question, uh, a few months ago we had a, a talk on the women's movement um, and the turnout of the audience um, out of about 130 people, we had four men, the rest were women. Um, and like in today we have like my professor, uh, gender balance. Um, but the question um, stems, stems from this. Um, and it is how, how uh, generally, how difficult is it to get people not directly affected by issues Feminism, 
Thank you. So, so we have a, a, a significant emphasis on allies, mainly because there are significantly more allies than there are LGBT people, so that just makes sense. Um, and we focus a lot of our time and energy on giving heterosexual people permission to care and be involved in this work. About a third of our staff are heterosexual, and that's quite deliberate. A third of our uh, senior management team is heterosexual, because actually you have to have lots of different voices talking about this stuff. And that kind of speaks to my point about don't just look in at each other. It is much more compelling when my mum, who has read everything I've ever written, and is probably one of the only people who's read everything I've ever written, talks positively about sexual orientation. So she used to be Dean of Nursing and Midwifery at Cardiff University, and at the beginning of every year did a big speech to all the new intake of nurses and midwives, and said, you know, I'm the Dean, turn to the person next to you, they'll be your friend for life, you know, you're going to go through this work, and it's all terrible, you might marry them, you might even enter into civil partnership. Uh, Cardiff University is fully committed to LGBT equality and beliefs, and da 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 And as she walks out, as she walks out, every young LGBT person in this new recruit goes, all right, Professor Sheila, great. And they tall, stand three feet tall, and they do much better throughout their whole career. It is effortless for her to do that. If I stood up and did that, they'd go, yeah, yeah, she's doing okay. And one of the reasons why we're very keen to recruit a diverse senior management team is because different people will register and resonate with different audiences. I resonate with a different audience compared to someone um, like Paul, who's in the back there, who's our director of campaigns, like Duncan, who's our director of membership programs. We need different people to resonate in different audiences, and that means we need heterosexual people. But generally, what we're seeing is that heterosexual people care about this because they have gay relatives, or they have you know, bisexual cousins or godparents. My godchildren all talk about Auntie Ruthie and her girlfriend, and that's kind of part of their narrative. It freaks out the teachers. Um, so the reality is that heterosexual people are affected and impacted by LGBT equality. The challenge for us is how we can convert that passion for inequalities experienced by my gay son to racism, sexism, disability, discrimination. And, and that is about how we create a much wider social movement. And one of the challenges we're facing at Stonewall is if we look in companies, gay men are now routinely the happiest subset of group in the companies we work with. Much happier than heterosexual men, much happier than everybody. Something about positive action that's taken place that has really made gay men stand tall. So we're now teaching those gay men how to acknowledge sexism in the room. So how can they, when they're set around a table of 10 men and one woman, and notice that women are being oppressed in that setting, how can we teach gay men to go, actually, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think Sandra should be speaking, actually. Because it is much easier for a gay man to do that than make Sandra in a room with 10 men go, well, actually, I haven't actually, oh, you just made my point, thank you very much. Um, so how can we empower gay men to do that? Then it alternatively, how can we make LGBT networks that are very strong in companies support black and minority ethnic networks and challenge racism. So how can we teach them to be good allies against racism? So we're taking our responsibility of lifting the LGBT communities to be more socially conscious of their responsibilities around than, um, than we have been in the past. But rather than go, what about me, it's about what about us? And that's been, that's been quite powerful. That's what I was going to ask actually. Um, I, mean, I was involved from the black and ethnic minority point of view in Scotland during the Section 28 campaign and uh, we campaign, you know, we joined with colleagues against uh, Graham Sunnah's campaign. That is, uh, but what uh, recently I was, I've been away for five years uh, from the UK. So recently I was speaking with colleagues in Scotland in Edinburgh and we were talking mainly with ethnic minority and we were saying that. Uh, do we need to have another sort of matter like the Stephen Lawrence for us, sort of for the government to do something about the black and ethnic minority? And we were talking about the Stonewall as well. Stonewall are doing great, but what have they, how are they supporting us? Yeah. Sort of, are they doing enough? And I'm very happy to hear what you have said, but is there anything that you can share or like uh, any work that is going on with? national black and ethnic minority or your future strategy? Absolutely, and thank you for the question. And I think I think what's, there's a general observation about the race BME movement in this country. And I think civil rights movements always falter when you achieve full legal equality. There's always something in every country, in every social movement that falters once you achieve legal equality. And it breaks my heart that there is not an equivalent of Stonewall around ethnicity existing in the UK. I think it's a real shame. And I think the Equality and Human Rights Commission 
um, is part of that problem, incidentally. So I wanted to do lots more, and I think that part of it has been about um, being the spokesman for deliberate spokesman for the LGBT movement, rather than empowering individuals to speak on behalf of themselves in the movement. I think I think that's been a big problem. What we want to do, so there's lots of role model programs that we're bringing in. Um, we sponsor Black Pride and have done a very proud to sponsor Black Pride for the last seven years. What we want to do is bring, enable as many uh, LGBT BAME people to come together for a conference. So find some money, divvy it out between all the BAME LGBT groups, get them all along, and then let's have a really good day deciding what the issues are, get some really positive um, film footage out about, because I think there's so little visible role models who are openly BAME and LGBT. So getting some of those, those visible issues going there, get the issues identified and then start working on them. In the same way we've done for trans, and then get them integrated. We receive a, 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 a lower number of applications to work at Stonewall than from BAME individuals, and it really worries us. And we've introduced mentoring programs and um, living wage internships that are restricted to people from minority backgrounds, and kind of very deliberately trying to change that picture in Stonewall. But it is, but it is something about the racism that exists in the gay community, deliberately use the word gay, that is deeply concerning, and that goes on more and more. Um, the assumption from white people that BME people are going to be racist is going on more and more. So I almost think we have a responsibility to look to ourselves and our own community before we go out almost to the heterosexual community. So, but that's very hard for someone to do. So we had an idea about doing a campaign which is like stop being, stop being rubbish to each other. It's, that's not the snappy headline, but basically, um, stop being biphobic, stop being transphobic, stop being racist. So kind of like look to yourselves. You know, you, you reckon you've got it made, gay men, but actually your sexism and lesbians, your attitude to trans people is unacceptable, and all of your attitudes to bisexual people, and the fact that gay men um, who are black can't go into a club without being approached because they're a drug dealer, all this is unacceptable. Get your shit together um, if you want to in any way be a beacon for other communities. Because I think if another community, say the Muslim community said, right, we're going to really tackle homophobia in our own community, we think that was the most radical thing we could do, it'd be brilliant. So why can't we as a gay community turn to ourselves and go, right, let's talk to ourselves about racism? Um, the board is twitched about that, because Stone will be in the kind of, especially with the woman leading, Stone will be the kind of mother in that, and going, let's be better behaved, is quite difficult to achieve. I spend quite a lot of time having to double think because I'm a woman. Um, the things I would be able to get away with if I was a man, I have to justify a lot more as a woman. It's very interesting. Um, that's another lecture. So there's, um, I think there'll be a lot more to come in the next year uh, about different things we're doing, but there's lots more to do. Um, I was just thinking about what you were saying then, because I, you know, the recognition that there is a lot of infighting, that's what we call it. And just in your opinion, do you think that could potentially have been a backlash on the kind of we are normal, but you know, kind of normalising it, but actually it's not normal, it's if you're white, if you're male, then I'd just be interested to hear your opinion on that. Um, I, think, I think every liberation movement in the history of the world has infighting. Um, I'm sure that you get on with your other players really well all the time. Um, so I think, I think there's a degree of that. I think I would love it if the backlash were about that. I don't think it is. I think the backlash is, is, is based on quite a selfish instinct. I think that the backlash around uh, trans women and radical feminism is a bit about that, and I think, I think there's something there that is very concerning and quite a difficult nut to crack. But I think the biphobia and I think the racism is just solid biphobia and racism. I think it would have been, it would have been easy, more easily talked about had the movement not been oversimplified during the last 15 years. But the question, and I don't know the answer, is would we have gained as much? And I, 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 I oscillate on it. And I oscillate on it because I think that there was enough appetite that the people who needed to be persuaded needed it to be keep simple. So when we go into building sites, and we're doing more and more work with builders, we talk about how calling each other gay because they can't lift bricks is really unacceptable. And we actually talk about trans because people transition who work in the building industry. We don't talk much about lesbians, except in the context of pornography on their walls. Because talking about um, lesbians in the workplace, we'll just be like, what? What are you talking about? I don't care about this. You know, 
my last screen was covering. So you do match the client a bit, so it's like, well, that's kind of what we're aware of. It's about when you when you go too far. And that's something we're constantly in check with ourselves on. And the staff put each other up on it. So if I talk about, if I'm sometimes in a very aggressive audience, um, I will naturally just talk about gay quite a lot. And the staff will go, what was that about? Come on. Um, so it's a bit about challenging our own anxiety sometimes. And going, actually, no, we can push this a bit further. And that's an ongoing process. If anybody wants to ask, they shall go first. One, one, more, one more question. Uh, my second question is, given the current sort of political situation in this country, what is um, Stonewall's sort of perspective, if you have uh, thought about it in terms of leading civil rights movement as an alternative political party in this country? <laughs> Easy. All right, one minute. Um, so, uh, so we're, we're very happy, because we've always been non, utterly, utterly non-party political, um, every politician I meet thinks I belong to a political party, and that's great. We have a uh, huge amount of support from Nikki Morgan in the Quality's office. We have a huge amount of support from the Prime Minister. Um, so we we have, yeah, so we're, we're fine. And, that's the world it is. Do I think that new political parties around civil movements are an effective way of achieving social change? No, I do not. Um, but that's a personal view. I think that it would require a significant machine to make that work effectively, and the risk is a, uh, a fragmentation of an existing liberal left agenda, and that can't be good for anyone. However, I think that this country is changing quite significantly, I think an increase in localised um, politics, more mayors, more um, local elections, more power being vested in local leaders who might be elected, so things like PPC, PPCs and police forces, gives the potential for more social movement-led initiatives, but I think on a national level, my instinct is it will be not as effective as it could be if it was just a pure social change model, influencing the existing political parties. But that's my very much my personal view of YouTube and everybody welcome to the Okay, done. Done. Thank you very much for joining us today. If you could all join me in uh, thank you.